Well, as the Congresswoman mentioned earlier, there are many opportunities available to us to reduce energy consumption that don't require fundamental breakthroughs in science or massive investments in, in uh, infrastructure or technology. And I'm here today to talk to you about one of those opportunities, one that is literally at your fingertips, your personal computer. Uh, computers are part of a broader category of energy consuming devices that we have in our offices. Things like scanners, printers, copiers, routers, hubs, lamps, radios, and things of that nature. Uh, that category of devices last year was responsible for consuming 116 billion kilowatt hours. And as you can see from this pie chart, computers represent the largest portion of that pie, 55% or so. Uh, is responsible, uh, is due to computers. And in fact, computers are the fastest growing individual source of energy consumption uh, in buildings today, in homes and buildings today. Why is that? Most people would tell you or believe that computers have become more energy efficient over the years. In fact, quite the opposite is true. Ten years ago, you could buy a state-of-the-art Pentium 3 500 megahertz computer or chip which itself would consume about 15 watts. Today's equivalent 3 gigahertz Pentium chip consumes 130 watts. So you can imagine having a 130 watt light bulb inside of a box that generates a lot of heat in addition to consuming a tremendous amount of energy. And as, a, as you can see from this curve, uh, the angle of increase is quite alarming. People do not buy computers based on how energy efficient they are. People buy computers based on how powerful they are and how fast they are. So on the one hand, we have computers that are consuming more and more energy. The computers not only have faster, more powerful, more uh, power-hungry processors, they also have bigger graphics cards, more memory, uh, other kinds of energy-consuming components. People are plugging in iPods and all sorts of things to their computers. And so the net overall energy consumption of the devices is rapidly escalating. On the other hand, we have more and more computers. Last year, 220 million computers were shipped worldwide. 220 million computers. And so when you combine the fact with uh, high energy consumption on a per device basis with a rapid proliferation in the number of devices, you get a result, uh, essentially a, a rapidly escalating increase in total energy consumption due to computers. And so let me just put that into a little bit of perspective. The average PC and monitor combination today consumes about 650 kilowatt hours. If you multiply that by the 168 million PCs in the United States, you're talking about an annual consumption of over 100 billion kilowatt hours. That's roughly equivalent to the energy used by 10% of U.S. households in 2001. The cost of that energy is roughly $8 billion. And the CO2 emissions associated with computer energy consumption, 160 billion pounds. Now, of course, the, the machines themselves don't emit carbon dioxide, but the energy that is generated to power them does. 80% or so of the energy electricity generated in the United States is coal generated electricity, which is not exactly clean. Now, that is the big picture. The issue available to us today, or the opportunity available to us today, is to reduce that energy consumption. And as it turns out, almost half of the energy used by most computers is wasted for the very simple reason that computers are left running when they're not being used. We've all had the experience of walking through an office and seeing computers on when there's nobody at the desk. Between 100 and 300 kilowatt hours are wasted, and that's the available savings opportunity. Uh, in the United States, that would aggregate to about 33 billion kilowatt hours annually, two and a half billion dollar savings opportunities, and an opportunity to reduce CO2 emissions by over 50 billion pounds. If we were to eliminate PC energy waste on every computer in the United States, that would be equivalent to removing four million cars from our highways permanently. Verdiem has developed a solution to this problem that is very simple and very elegant. As you know, each individual PC has power controls that allow you to put the PC to sleep or into a hibernate mode at different times of the day. 
Well, unfortunately, 80% or so of users disable those controls simply because they don't understand how to configure them properly or they don't understand the magnitude of the energy waste on their PC. And so Verdium has developed a software application, a client-server software application, that essentially provides a way to synchronize and coordinate the power settings on hundreds or thousands of personal computers. This is obviously a product that's sold to organizations as opposed in, uh, to into a home environment. So schools, counties, government agencies, corporations that have hundreds or thousands of computers can use a product like this to standardize the power settings on all of those computers. Those settings can be configured to have the machines be shut down or put into low power states at different times of the day, uh, on holidays, weekends, etc. It's a very simple concept, one that you could explain to, to a 10-year-old. Our software also, and this is very important, measures the actual energy consumption on the computer network. It measures the amount of time each computer spends in each of its energy states and uses that information to calculate the total energy consumption. And by providing this level of visibility, we can now understand how much energy our computers are actually consuming and how much energy we can potentially save. And finally, the product can be installed in a matter of hours. So in comparison with most energy conservation measures, which are capital intensive, uh, capital disruptive, things like lighting systems, uh, replacing boilers, replacing windows, these are fairly disruptive uh, changes. Uh, our product is software. It's the only software product ever approved by the federal government as an energy efficiency measure. In other words, it's available, it's qualified for utility rebates. It is a pure software product, can be installed in a few hours. Uh, just to give you a perspective, our product saves on average about 200 kilowatt hours per PC per year. So an organization in California with about 10,000 PCs might be spending today roughly $800,000 to power those PCs. With a product like ours, you can reduce that cost right off the top by about a quarter million dollars, saving 2 million kilowatt hours and over 3 million pounds of CO2. If you look at the numbers spread across larger and larger PC groups, they become even more compelling. Uh, a mid-sized corporation in America today might have 75,000 PCs. The potential savings there is 15 million kilowatt hours per year, which is a, uh, a fairly significant uh, energy savings. And then from an environmental perspective, the opportunity to save uh, CO2 is fairly compelling as well. The, I like to put it in equivalent terms, number of cars removed from the highway, because most people can relate to that. 1,700 vehicles taken off the highway. And again, as I mentioned before, if every computer in the United States had software like this, we would remove 4 million vehicles from the highway and save over 33 billion kilowatt hours. So in summary, PCs are the fastest growing energy consumer in buildings today. And there seems to be no end to that trend. Uh, the waste is fairly significant. About a third of the energy consumption is purely wasted because people are not using their machines when they're left on. We think that this kind of technology represents the low-hanging fruit in terms of energy efficiency because it's pure software. It can be installed very easily. It has a measurable energy savings uh, aspect to it, and it has a one-year ROI as opposed to most energy efficiency technologies which have a five to ten year payback. Uh, and finally, there's a significant environmental benefit associated with this technology. We're, uh, we're seeing interest in our product from a lot of major corporations. Uh, a major corporation that has 100,000 PCs might save $2 million with this type of software. That's not a lot of money for a big corporation. It doesn't really move the dial, so to speak. But they're interested in the environmental aspect, the ability to, to put out a press release and say to their customers and shareholders, we are doing something good for the environment. And by the way, it's saving us money too. Uh, and so that's a significant benefit associated with this technology. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to start off just with a, a comment on uh, this morning about uh, entrepreneurs and, and what makes them. My personal philosophy is that it's uh, hereditary and that uh, I believe I have entrepreneurism and, and energy technology deeply embedded in my DNA <clears throat> through my father, who is uh, Paul Craig, 
And Paul spent the first 30 years of his career uh, designing and commercializing uh, <clears throat> generators for uh, turbine generators for APUs and uh, turbo compressors for the auto industry. Towards the tail end of his career, uh, he co-founded a company that became Capstone Turbine. And he brought that through commercialization. And at the very end of his career, he and I, along with three other engineers from Capstone, co-founded Pentadyne. That was five years ago. And now we're in the, the business of commercializing flywheel technology, where the Capstone uh, machine is a uh, contraption for energy generation. The flywheel power system is a machine for energy storage. So whereas a chemical battery would store energy in the chemical reaction, the flywheel stores kinetic energy. And I'll explain that in a little more detail. Uh, first, with a few highlights uh, of our business, we spent the last few years uh, developing the technology, fielding units in beta field trials, and we are now entering commercialization. Uh, we have distribution partners that I'll describe in a little more detail. And our focus is in the backup power market the $6 billion market for uninterruptible power supplies. We also have some applications that are starting to emerge in the industrial drive market, which is about $4 billion uh, worldwide annually. Uh, our management team, as I mentioned, has a history in the energy technology space at Capstone. Uh, we also have uh, key senior managers from Active Power. Uh, the heart and soul of the business is the intellectual property. We have 12 patents uh, with an additional two pending. And our stage of development is early commercial production. We have 40 units in the field and about 200,000 hours of operation. Uh, we are a venture-funded company. Uh, we've raised over $30 million to date. Some of our investors are in the audience. Uh, they include Inth Power. It's a very well-known uh, investor in the energy tech space. Rustic Canyon Partners is the largest VC here in Southern California. And we have a number of utilities from Detroit Edison to EDF, the world's largest utility, uh, <clears throat> to Sempra, the utility in Southern California. And Ben Rosen, who is the founder of Compact Computer, is also a 10% a shareholder. Uh, so we sell through distributors who sell to end users. And uh, these end users are looking for a means of ensuring reliable, high quality supply of power to run their operations continuously. Uh, the issue is that the grid uh, is fairly reliable. It's 99.9% .9 reliable, which uh, by most measures is pretty good. But there's still eight minutes out of the year where you don't have high quality, highly reliable power. And unfortunately, those eight minutes aren't all together. They can't be predicted when they're going to happen. They're made up of hundreds of minor interruptions uh, that for you and I, we'd, we'd notice the lights flickering. But if you're a data center or a semiconductor fab, uh, that's a, a shutdown of your process, a lot of cost, scrap material to get, uh, to get back in, in business. <clears throat> so our distributors sell to end users uh, in industry like uh, Smith uh, <clears throat> GlaxoSmithKline is a, uh, f a pharmaceutical company that's a customer. The healthcare market, uh, Scripps Green Hospital down in San Diego is, is an in-use customer. In broadcasting, WBRZ in Baton Rouge, Louisiana had just installed our system prior to Hurricane uh, Katrina. They were the only broadcaster in Baton Rouge that stayed online uh, during the hurricane, so that was a Unfortunate event, but uh, something that, that we're proud that we helped that company stay online. Uh, and then data centers. We uh, provide the, the backup power at the NASA Glenn Research Center in Ohio that uh, powers their, uh, their data center. <clears throat> so the, to quantify the interruptions I had mentioned, 98% uh, of the power quality glitches are, are minor. Uh, they are two seconds or less. This is a histogram, frequency of interruption by duration of interruption by depth of voltage sag. So most of the events that wreak havoc for uh, continuous processes are very short in interruption. The, the longer ones that get most of the attention are very infrequent but uh, cause uh, brownouts or blackouts like we saw in the Northeast a few years ago. 
So in a traditional backup power system, you'd have utility coming through the grid that gets cleaned through UPS and then supplied to a critical load. And in those minor interruptions, a few milliseconds to a couple seconds, banks of lead acid batteries will kick in and they'll provide the power so that the, the critical load doesn't see an interruption. And in those rare occurrences where there's a longer interruption, a diesel genset will fire, that'll go through the UPS for cleaning, and that'll power the, uh, the critical load. The weakest link in this solution is the lead acid batteries. <clears throat> and not only are the batteries very expensive because of frequent maintenance, relatively short life, uh, three to five years is the expected life of a, of a backup battery in those applications, but they're also very unreliable. More than 90% of all the problems, all the failures of a UPS system are because the batteries don't come online when they're called on. Batteries are a chemical reaction. They're very sensitive to temperature, to uh, depth of discharge, to number of discharges. So it's impossible to tell the state of charge in a battery system, which is why they're prone to failure. <clears throat> they also run in series. Uh, to get the power and the voltage required in these UPS backup systems, you have to put 40 jars of batteries to create a string. And if one cell in one of those jars fails, the entire string is down. So you have a very unreliable solution to uh, the backup power. They also contain lead and acid, which are pretty nasty substances. <clears throat> so the pentadyne solution is to replace lead acid batteries in the UPS equation. Uh, our system can provide as much power as necessary. It's modular. We run in parallel versus series. So if one of our systems happens to fail, uh, the other systems will carry the load. And in the occasion where a customer is not ready for emotional or other reasons to get rid of their batteries, uh, we can go in front of the batteries, we'll take all those short hits that otherwise would chew up the life of the battery, uh, and when and if the batteries are ever called on, they'll be much more reliable because they haven't been exercised. So this is a cross-section of what we sell. It's the flywheel. Uh, it's about six feet tall, has a footprint of about six feet, six square feet. It weighs 1,300 pounds and it provides uh, roughly 200 kilowatts of power uh, with a duration sufficient to ride through to the startup of a genset. This is a cross-section of the, uh, the inside of the flywheel, which I'll, I'll describe in a little more detail. Uh, the flywheel itself is this aqua area. It's made out of uh, carbon fiber, very strong material uh, that we rotate at uh, roughly 60,000 RPM, so 1,000 revolutions per second. It's mounted to this shaft, which is magnetically levitated. So there's no metal-to-metal -metal contact, there's no friction points, there's no parts that wear out in a bearing system. Magnetically levitated, we also generate an internal vacuum system. So we've removed friction and we've reduced the aerodynamic drag in the system such that this spins without a lot of forces to slow it down. <clears throat> We have a motor generator that's attached to the shaft that's spinning in a stator. That's how we get power in and out of, of the system. Uh, and then the safety system is a dual chamber approach with this inner vessel being a, a pressure vessel essentially uh, and an outer containment here. In a worst case event, if the carbon fiber were to separate, uh, it disintegrates, behaves much more like a fluid than a solid would take the shape of this inner housing, transfer its torque to the inner housing, which is attached to the outer through shear pins, and would shear and spin down in our cooling fluid, which acts as a hydraulic brake. So instead of releasing all of our energy at once, which would want to turn the cabinet across the floor, uh, we dissipate it internally, and it's a relatively benign event. So with that is the technology uh, overview, what customers are really interested in, or what are the benefits. The bearing, or the lack of the bearings, the magnetic levitation system means no maintenance. Nothing wears out, nothing gets replaced. The internal vacuum system means we don't need an external pump. There's no lubrication, no maintenance items. Uh, the type of motor generator we selected, shrink, uh, synchronous reluctance, uh, there's a lot of technical merits, but for the customer, as very low standby losses. So we're in standby 99.9% .9 of the time, 
uh, and we have very low losses while we're in standby. Uh, the carbon fiber, we chose carbon fiber because it's much more uh, stronger than steel, it allows us to spin at higher speeds. And the energy storage in a rotating object is proportional to the square of the speed, linear proportional to the mass. So we take a very so a strong substance, spin it at high speeds, we get the, uh, the higher energy storage for the same footprint. And our safety system for the customer means very low installation costs. Uh, in terms of power, a single unit will do about 200 kilowatts for 10 seconds, 100 kilowatts for about 30 seconds, and then we can do as many units in parallel as required, and we have applications up to 10 megawatts uh, where we're providing grid stabilization for uh, wind farms and other utility uh, applications. This is a, a comparison, an economic comparison of pentadyne versus active power and lead acid batteries. Active power is a, a public uh, flywheel company. They IPO'd in 2000. Uh, they did about $20 million in revenue last year, and they have a $200 million market cap. So very, uh, very attractive multiple on, uh, on their revenue. Uh, they're priced uh, slightly above us. Uh, and we are priced about 50% higher than lead acid batteries. Our payback versus lead acid batteries is about 24 months and it's driven by the maintenance cost and by the life cycle of batteries. We recommend a, a preventive maintenance call where you come and check on torque stripes and make sure the display is working. Active power needs to replace uh, contact bearings and maintenance of vacuum pump. And then batteries require quarterly maintenance for cleaning, voltage checks, et cetera. Uh, where we last for 20 years, batteries last about four years. So by the time we've exhausted the life of our product, you have gone through 200 lead acid batteries, which are about the size of your, car, uh, your car's battery. Finding a place to dispose of those batteries is, a, is an increasing challenge and a costly challenge. Uh, we're about half the footprint of active and batteries about a third the weight of active power, uh, about a quarter of the weight of lead acid batteries. Uh, and our standby losses, which is 99.9% uh, .9 of the time, since we have no friction and very little aerodynamic drag, uh, we have very low losses, 300 watts compared to active power in order of magnitude higher, and we're about half that of batteries. Our approach to market is to sell through distributors. We look for scaled partners that really know the end user markets and have a sales and service capability. Uh, in North America, we are partnered with Liebert, who is the world's largest three-phase UPS manufacturer. They take our product, integrate it with theirs, and provide sales and servicing in the field. Uh, what we're announcing, actually, uh, at this conference is that we've partnered in Europe and Asia with Sokomec. Sokomec is a French company. They're the new, number two UPS player in Europe and Asia. And uh, of note, they're the fastest growing UPS provider in China. Uh, we'll be rolling out with them in the second quarter of this year. Our largest uh, in-use customer is outside of the UPS space. It's in the industrial drive market, and it's the US Air Force. Uh, we've won the world's largest flywheel contract for 500 systems, $30 million over the next five years. Uh, and the application is in a nuclear missile silo for energy recycling. And our application is to provide power to lift and lower this 17,000 pound plug. Uh, this is what seals off entrance to the silo and lowers to let in personnel and equipment. Well, this is driven by an adjustable speed drive. Now, as that mass is lowering, you've got kinetic energy stored in a raised object. As it lowers the drive regions, that spins us up. We store that energy until needed, and we provide the high power that closes this door within 30 seconds. Currently, it takes 30 minutes to open and close this door because they don't have the power infrastructure at the site. Instead of building power to the site, they put energy storage in the silo, uh, and we can do this cycle in under 30 seconds. Uh, one last comment on this. This is where I think uh, the future growth uh, and the, the engine, the fuel for pentadyne is. Uh, we'll make a very good, very attractive business out of backup power and UPS, uh, but this application is the tip of the iceberg for what pentadyne will be doing in energy recycling. 
You take this same concept, apply it to elevators, apply it to cargo cranes, uh, trains coming in and out of stations. Any application with high power for relatively short duration is, uh, is custom made for this. This is tip of the iceberg. Uh, and then to wrap up, this is our financial forecast. Uh, we are growing rapidly. Last year we did about a half a million dollars. Uh, we'll grow 10x uh, this year, do just over uh, 5 million. Of note, this year we will have positive gross margin. Uh, and unfortunately for the industry, and fortunately for Pentadyne, we'll be one of the few energy technology early stage companies with positive gross margin. Uh, by 2007, we'll be doing about $20 million in sales. Uh, and then in 2008, we'll be doing just over $30 million, uh, and we'll be profitable at the EBITDA level. So uh, thank you for your attention. I'll be pleased to answer questions uh, outside afterwards. Hello, everyone. Um, my, my presentation adds on very nicely to the, uh, to the previous speakers and actually is a continuation of the theme uh, of uh, Professor Foucault's film uh, uh, over the lunch break. Uh, we talk about, and I, I will talk about, energy efficient lighting technology and uh, it actually is, can create in the future one of the ideal marriages of new deployments of energy generation and uh, renewable energy generation and uh, new lighting technology. Uh, at the beginning, let me give a brief introduction uh, for Cree. Uh, as, as, uh, as was mentioned, Cree is, uh, has a location here in, uh, in Santa Barbara uh, and is part of a corporation that's headquarters North, uh, headquartered in North Carolina and uh, is an ideal example of uh, how how commerce, uh, how concept can, brought, uh, can be brought to, com uh, to commerce. Cree in North Carolina was a startup uh, generated out of NC State here in California, generated out of UCSB, and is now a 1,400 people company uh, that generated in uh, fiscal 05 uh, $389 million of uh, revenue. And one of our prime, the dominating product lines is uh, light, uh, our, our light, uh, light emitting diodes, which create 83% uh, uh, of our revenue right now. And we believe that uh, light emitting diodes are going to be the future of the lighting industry um, uh, moving on. What is the, the challenge in lighting today? Uh, these pie charts, I think, create an, a picture a little bit of what's going on in lighting today. Uh, we have up here the total, oops, uh, so the upper, the upper left graph uh, shows the total energy consumption in the U.S. and about 22% 20, of, of the total energy consumptions are uh, used for lighting. Uh, about half of that, 42%, are generated or are used for, by incandescent light sources. This half, uh, this, these 42%, 321 terawatt hours of energy total in the US create only 12% uh, of the light that generated. And that's a huge disparity uh, and uh, return on energy uh, that, uh, that is wasted basically in essence goes to heat. Uh, Additionally, incandescent light sources are very, uh, are very unreliable, as everyone knows. About uh, one of every three installed bul bulbs need to be replaced. Uh, this is basically for existing lighting companies a license to print money. Uh, because uh, about 56% uh, of the dollars spent today uh, in, in the lighting industry basically go to the replacement of these inefficient light sources. Uh, challenge number two, besides the energy generation, this is a map uh, that was shown already by previous speakers uh, of generated by NASA of the, of the world. And on the one hand, it shows the potential for new lighting technology where, where light is all uh, generated. Uh, but on the other hand, it shows these vast dark spots uh, on Earth where, now, where in essence very little lighting is deployed. And, uh, and this is a, a tremendous challenge as we move forward. Oops, I guess I have difficulties here with the direction. Uh, <clears throat> uh, 
This is a chart uh, that was generated by the Department of Energy and shows the forecast of to total energy consumption uh, worldwide. Uh, the blue bars indicate what's expected for the uh, developed economies uh, like US, Europe, uh, and there's expected to be about a 10% growth uh, over the next uh, uh, 20 years. On the other hand, though, these dark areas that, uh, that, that were shown on the map, they are expected to grow by 50%. Um, for that reason, we have the summit here. We talked a lot about the challenge in energy uh, generation, but at the same time, uh, uh, the energy use uh, will grow uh, uh, also. And the dark areas on the, on the map, they really create a tremendous opportunity for new energy efficient technology. Um, a statistic that was provided by the, by the World Bank shows that uh, right now about 2 billion people on Earth do not have access to reliable uh, 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 electricity. And at the same time, as was shown very nicely in the movie over, uh, over lunch, these people, since they don't have access to technology, they also don't have access to lighting. So you see the dark areas in the map. And that's a tremendous challenge uh, as we move forward. <laughs> So how do we meet this challenge? Of course, uh, we can find more energy or we create new ways uh, to, um, uh, to create existing uh, energy. Or we use less for the developing economies. This is not an acceptable, uh, acceptable, man acceptable mantra right now. Uh, the speaker yesterday from the Department of Energy showed the predictions for uh, for oil use in the US just for transportation. And this was a chart up and to the right, growing, keeps, keep, it, it keeps growing basically. And that's, uh, that's not sustainable in the future, clearly. So what, we, what the focus of our company is, is uh, to use the existing technology more wisely to improve the return on energy. And we do this pretty much with every technology that we are developing in our company far and foremost with lighting. Uh, we uh, increase the, 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 we develop light sources that improve the lumens per watt generated, uh, lumens, per <coughs> excuse me, lumens per watt generated, uh, but we also work on electronic technology that have the potential of increasing the miles per gallon for cars or uh, the efficiency of electrical motors. So we believe that with this, with this combination, solid state lighting and the other technologies a, have the potential to save energy and money, but B, also can sustain uh, global development. So this, uh, this is an example or just a brief tutorial of uh, what solid state lighting actually is. Um, the left shows the uh, ubiquitous uh, incandescent light bulb uh, with all its known features. I want to point far and foremost uh, to, the, uh, to the spectral graph down here. The yellow curve indicates the visible spectrum uh, where the eye is sensitive. So this is where we want to generate light. And the purple curve indicates what the incandescent light bulb actually does. It generates 95 to 89 percent, uh, 95 to 98 uh, percent of its energy in the infrared spectrum, and which, is which is basically emitted as heat. On the contrast, on the right-hand side, it shows an example of a solid-state light source with an LED chip at its core. And uh, by choosing the semiconductor material correctly, we can generate the, uh, the light emission, in essence, in every, in every spectrum, in every spectral range, uh, uh, and can position the emission such that it is basically, uh, ideally, uh, covering the visible uh, emission of the uh, or the, the visible response of the eye. Uh, furthermore, LEDs have the advantage of being uh, reliable. We have 10 percent. We have 10 years lifetime. Uh, LEDs don't fail catastrophically. They are robust. They can be dropped on the floor. They are cool to touch. So they don't generate excessive heat, as in the case of incandescent light sources. So um, the previous graph showed a very narrow emission. What is desired, uh, of course, is that we don't have a very narrow emission in one, just one color of the visible spectrum, but we want a broadband emission to cover the entire spectral range. <clears throat> and there are several methods how one can do this with solid state light emitters, and the two predominant ones are shown here. One can mix several, the light of several 
a colored emitters like a blue, green, and a red source to create a white light spectrum, or one combines uh, the light of, an, of a single black blue emitter with a phosphor light source and it creates white light that way. The typical materials of choice uh, are listed here for inorganic light emitters. Uh, one is aluminum aluminum nitride that's worked on in our company, and for the light emission spectrum, it's aluminum aluminum phosphide. So we, how do LEDs today stack up uh, against uh, existing light sources? We already talked about the incandescent light bulb. Uh, this is about, has an efficiency of about 10 lumens per watt, and LEDs basically surpassed that uh, in the, uh, like, around like 1995, 1996 in the time frame. And the blue curve up there in the right graph uh, shows how LEDs have evolved over the last couple of years, and in 2005, we basically exceeded the efficiency of fluorescent light bulbs. So LEDs today, in the, in the, on, a, on a volume basis, have the ability uh, to produce light that's as efficient as the most widely de deployed energy efficient light source, the, uh, the fluorescent lamp. So where is solid state lighting today? You don't see it in this room, uh, so it's not, it's not everywhere. But LED, uh, LEDs make inroads in specialty, specialty lighting applications. Why is that? Well, uh, LEDs have unique benefits, as I pointed out already, in terms, of the life, uh, in terms of the lifetime, in terms of the color that can, can be created, in terms of the robustness. And therefore, LEDs is primarily used right now in specialty lighting applications. And some of the examples are shown here. In architectural lighting, it's used for its decorative uh, effect by creating basically facades where the color uh, becomes a key design element for brand recognition, for like just uh, architectural, for its architectural features, becomes a, a method convey information and to make facades, facades like this place. Another, yeah, another, another example is uh, the automotive applications and where, where LEDs basically based on the lifetime uh, become uh, uh, designed in for new, new vehicles and cars. Um, so why not a ubiquitous? We don't, we don't right now uh, have the cost structure uh, that is required uh, to penetrate general, general lighting applications. At 2000, in 2006, our LEDs basically cost about uh, $120 to, uh, uh, to generate 1,000 lumen. That's equivalent uh, to a $75 light bulb. So clearly, we have challenges ahead of us. Um, however, that's, it's, it's no the, the roadmaps are laid out, and uh, semiconductor technology uh, has shown uh, that it can scale. And over the last years, basically, power LEDs have, have met this roadmap, and uh, we see that a cost reduction, which is here shown in lumens per wafer, uh, uh, can be achieved by like more than order of magnitude. So uh, within the next five to 10 years, uh, LEDs will make inroads, basically, in general lighting. Uh, applications. Uh, the potential ultimately is shown on this slide where LEDs by, can save 29% of the energy uh, that's uh, right now used for, uh, used for lighting, which is the equivalent of 30 to 50 uh, 500 megawatt fossil power plants, depending on the penetration on the market. There has been significant recognition uh, in, the, uh, in, in the governments, not just in the US, but also in Asia and in Europe. And lighting initiatives have been started basically all over the world uh, to make the penetration of, uh, of solid-state lighting technology real. So uh, the lighting of the future will happen if LEDs become a commodity source, therefore, uh, as was mentioned in the video, standardization has to happen, the costs will come down, uh, which is the job of companies like ours, and education and marketing has to be improved in order to make the consumer aware 
of these, of these new trends. Uh, and to close the loop with my introduction, uh, LEDs have also the possibility to, uh, to make global development viable. In the video earlier, this, these examples, some of these examples were shown as well, where solid state lighting technology married with photovoltaics can basically create new applications that bring light to the world. And with that, uh, I want to conclude. We've just heard uh, three terrific presentations from three companies that are addressing energy efficiency and conservation problems, three different problems, three different uh, approaches, and I'd be uh, interested in hearing the panel's thoughts on uh, what challenges the companies have already met and what challenges face them in the future. Well, I'll take a, a first crack at um, a couple of the topics we heard this afternoon. In regards to the computer power recycling or, or power conservation technology idea, I think it's a great idea. Um, and um, um, that's an example of, to me, uh, this is very interesting how, you know, you have this proliferation of electronic devices in, in businesses and homes. And collectively, if you, if you um, count up all of the power that's consumed by electronic devices, there's a significant amount of power that's consumed at the home. So I think there's great opportunities for new companies to develop new products and services that will help homeowners and businesses conserve power when devices are not being used directly. For instance, in my own home, I have to tell my children all the time, remind them to turn the power button off on the VCR DVD devices because they're just consuming power. Likewise, with your cell phones, if you're, if you're plugging in, if you're adapters, power adapters are plugged in, uh, whether your, your phone is connected to that wire or not, it's still consuming power. So I think that's, that's a perfect opportunity. We're very supportive with the high-speed uh, flywheel concepts from an electric power point of view, and I know Flint Craig mentioned that there were some opportunities um, on, on energy storage applications such as a rail station, and certainly Semper Energy will be working perhaps with Pentadyne and other manufacturers to demonstrate that technology. Um, finally, in the area of, of lighting technologies, uh, it's, it's grateful to know that there's a, um, another technology that's helping bridge the gap, if you will, to the LED world, and that is compact fluorescent um, technologies. Maybe I'll just make a couple of general comments. Um, I'm, I'm very intrigued by this uh, set of, of companies from the perspective that what they're doing today is economically viable and should make money. In other words, it's not a requirement to have a subsidy to make this happen. They have customers today that are interested in their technologies. As a venture capitalist, this is the kind of company that we're interested in watching and following up on. I think it's also a general comment about the space. I mean, I, I don't think there's any doubt that today is sort of the golden age of clean tech. We've, you know, a year ago or two years ago, if I'd mentioned clean technology or energy technology in a lot of the boardrooms of companies I deal with, um, I'd have if not sh been shouted out of the room, I've certainly been told to be quiet and sit down. Today, um, I just, I'm coming back from three weeks on the road, got back last night, which included places like India, where um, this message and, and technologies that relate to the subject are demanding our attention um, literally 24 hours a day. It's just a very different world. That's being driven a lot by the science and the technology that comes out of places like UCSB that are coming up with new things, like some of the things that you see at, at Cree Lighting that uh, are valuable and viable today. That's a message that I think should be a theme of this conference and that sustainability has to be commercially sustainable. Um, a lot of things that have to do with government policy tend to uh, distort that picture, which is, uh, again, a particular bugbear of mine. If we find things that are truly economic, they're going to make it on their own and will be successful in the marketplace. Right now, technologies that um, improve on current processes or improve our cost effective today, like the three you saw just now, are excellent ways to reduce our energy balance or reduce the energy utilization. Technologies that you'll see in, I think, the third panel today where we're using existing energy sources, like coal, in ways that are uh, are positive and result in lowering of carbon uh, emissions will also be very important. And that's sort of the third theme I would, would sort of bring up, um, that 
I think is worth contemplating as the conference goes on. We're now seeing the first generation of companies that will, will hit the marketplace in an era of carbon trading. And this has and make, makes a link between the things that Accre Lighting will do, that Verdium will do, that uh, Canarca will do, and so forth. And the balance between which technologies create the most credits or create the most value in the marketplace in that area is going to drive you know, where this industry goes in the next, uh, say, 10 years. We don't know what that's going to look like yet, but it's clearly going to be different than it is today. We don't really know yet how that will impact on each of the technologies we're looking at. I just think it's fascinating to watch how that kind of plays out. It's also interesting as a final note to say that as one of the, the countries that has gone uh, basically short on carbon, doesn't believe it's important through our decisions on Kyoto, we're in a very different position than a country like China that is all of a sudden saying things like no more two cycle engines. Uh, in big cities. There's, you know, where we thought, I think we thought that was a viable economic decision several years ago. I'd question today whether or not we have an interesting flip where all of a sudden a decision to do that versus supporting some of the companies you're seeing at this conference isn't a far better route to have, uh, have followed. Good afternoon. Um, my name is uh, Chris McGill. I'm with the American Gas Association. And AGA principally represents the large distributors of natural gas to natural gas consumers. And I'm going to take a little bit of a different tact as we look at this and um, talk to you a little bit about the people that I speak to on a regular basis as an AGA representative and tie a little bit of the policy and the economics of all of these things that I've seen yesterday and today with respect to technology. In July of this past year, in 2005, one of my jobs is to be out talking to customer groups and consumer groups on behalf of the local utilities. And we were telling customers in the Midwest of the United States that they should expect to spend 70% more for their home heating this year than the prior year. Not 7%. 70% more. We're in a constrained environment for supply of a number of our fuels, in this case a fossil fuel natural gas. We've had a very, very warm winter heating season this year, so it has mitigated some of that cost impact. That begins to get people's attention, and not just the consumer groups f representing customers who literally can't pay their bills, but it begins to get the attention of people who can pay their bills when they know they're paying two and three times more what they have paid in the past. So there's, there's an opportunity here. There's also always an opportunity for consumer education. And I haven't quite figured out whether that's the role of organizations like mine or the federal government or universities or, or whatever. I, I'm not sure. I can tell you, it may not be the case in California, but I can tell you for the most part it is the case in Iowa and Wisconsin and Michigan and other places that people understand certain things about their energy world and their energy consumption. For, for natural gas specifically, um, the average consumer uses 25% less today than they did in 1980. Everybody knows they are buying more efficient appliances when they go out and buy an appliance. No one knows that energy consumption in this country is increasing. They don't, they don't know that. They don't know that as our economy grows, energy consumption is growing with it. They think it's going down. And for the average consumer, that's a problem. Now, the average consumer is going to the gasoline pump. With the case of electricity and natural gas, the average consumer doesn't pay for it until they use it. The economic signals that should be there that would perhaps change consumer behavior are essentially dampened by the system that we have. We do whatever we can to keep people from paying these volatile prices and 
keep things a little more steady to that consumer. So there's a challenge here. There's not only a challenge in terms of meeting requirements for supply of these sources of energy, but also a challenge to educate people as to what it is economic growth means and how they fit into that. Thank you. I served as the vice chair of the California Energy Commission from 1995 to the year 2000. And I learned many things as part of that job. First of all, people don't care about their energy bills. They really don't. They're not significant in this country yet. Uh, when they look at their appliance decisions, and I have, looked, I have talked to many appliance dealers as I built a new house myself, they say very few people ask about the energy efficiency of the appliance. They're glad to get it. They'll take the savings, but they're not interested. Consumers look for other benefits. And the history we've had at the Energy Commission was that people buy on other benefits than energy efficiency. Setback thermostats are a very good example. There's quite a controversy whether setback thermostats actually save energy. But in fact, they do give a lot of comfort to people. So they like them. They buy them because they add comfort to their lives. And I would challenge all of you in the area of energy efficiency to do things that make life better for people while saving energy, rather than saying, you better take this tonic, you need it to save energy, because they won't buy it. They buy because they have a better ice maker. Uh, Joe Sixpack does not want his own distributed generation unit. He wants a big screen TV or a Toyota Tundra pickup truck because he can brag about it. Energy efficiency is not a bragging area. You have to package this with a benefit to the user. Having said that, one of the areas that I am working on personally that I think ties this all together, and these three presentations were very good at being big chunks of that, is what I would call a sustainable community or a lead community, where every neighborhood has its own generation facilities, has its own disposable, disposal and recycling facilities. Neighborhood recycling or, uh, centers or neighborhood energy centers, neighborhood resource centers, we often call them. And this way, there's no NIMBY. You generate your power, you get rid of your waste. You minimize what goes into the community, you minimize what goes out. At the same time, you enjoy a higher level of life comforts. You have to do that. I will emphasize that. Second point I'd like to make in all this is I learned the hard way when I worked in industry, working on gas turbine industries. I was an eager young researcher showing how all the efficiency could be gained in gas turbine engines. And I was told by the sales department, our customers don't buy energy efficiency. They buy reliability. If that new efficient engine dies for one day in the year, they've lost all the energy efficiency and money for 10 years of production. They can lose a million dollars worth of product by having an unreliable product. So I would say also that whatever you do in your new products, and, and I see this uh, especially in the area of the flywheels with Flint, he said he already has 200,000 hours of service. That's excellent. That's what people look for. Before you get a product out, test the living daylights out of it. Because if you make a mistake, there's no second chance. They don't come back often. So reliability is a key issue when you go for energy efficiency. Uh, and I'm a strong believer in combining energy efficiency with reliability. I think you can have those. But be careful, there are other things that trip you up on the path. Thank you. So I have a follow-up question for um, uh, Chris McGill. Um, you said that the main problem seems to be that you can't get the consumers to change their behavior. Do you have any specific thoughts on how that might uh, tend to happen? Obviously, the gas prices cause people to go out and buy hybrids, but are there other things that companies can do to try to either market to people to change their behaviors or change their products to change behaviors? My observation is that that happens when there is an economic incentive to do so, and as was noted here, when, when there is a quality of life incentive to do so. Um, specifically, uh, that's something we struggle with continuously. Um, uh, I mean, you know, you can only install so many towel warmers in, 
in homes, and, and you can only, you know, natural gas, yes, can heat a swimming pool, and, you know, but, you know, these are very, very fundamental needs for people. Um, I'm, I'm not sure there is always um, a better way. The, the better way for most people, reliability, certainly for the natural gas industry, is, is paramount. Um, the cost side is, is um, also very, very important. Okay. And, and Steve Perry, uh, how would it affect your decision making in terms of investing in a company, um, whether they were uh, up against this kind of consumer behavior issue or, and relying on subsidiaries? Uh, great question. You know, we, when we look for companies to invest in, we look for companies that offer value that the consumer will buy as configured. Great example was in the in the uh, solid state lighting marketplace. Um, you know, Cree makes a fantastic product. It's coming down in cost all the time. Um, if you can install light bulbs in your house that create daylight conditions, starting with light early in the morning that looks like morning light to light in the evening that looks uh, like evening light and costs you less than the cost of a regular light bulb. You're going to buy that product. There are companies in the marketplace today. We're an investor in one called Renaissance Lighting. There's another public company called uh, uh, Color Kinetics that are are moving in that direction. Those are the kind of products that create uh, changes in the energy balance because they drive the customer to buy based on the quality of the product. That, to me, is the exciting part about this. There are products coming out now that that really look like that. They are they are better than what we did before. They have a value proposition, and in addition, they also save energy. So it's a, it's a pretty exciting world that you see that kind of transition occurring. 